and the heart and soul of South Carolina was broken. And so we have some grieving too. And we've got some pain we have to go through. Parents are having to explain to their kids how they can go to church and feel safe. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we uh, are still covering, of course, the uh, continued uh, story of the uh, horrific church shooting that took place in South Carolina in Charleston. And uh, the uh, suspect, Dylan uh, Roof, has waived extradition back to South Carolina from North Carolina, where he was captured. 21-year-old, uh, uh, nine dead, um, and uh, he had an arrest record, two previous arrests. Joining us now to talk about uh, the, the, the horrific situation and, and what would make somebody or might make somebody commit this kind of uh, murder is America's psychologist, Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, uh, course director at Turo College, and uh, also, of course, uh, you get him at drjeffgardier.com. Hello, sir. Uh, good to see you, sir. How are you? Always good to talk to you, Doc. Um, what, what could you make, you know, from what you know so far, um, what, what could you make of a 21-year-old who has such hatred and bigotry and bias and then carries it out by not just walking into a place quickly and shooting as many people and trying to get away, but sitting there for an hour uh, before he makes the victims his victims? Well, I, I guess uh, you could take it right out of uh, Psych 101, Steve. Uh, another very severe personality disorder who appears to be fitting the uh, profile of uh, other mass shooters, was a bit of a loner, was abusing drugs, recreational drugs, marijuana, uh, quite recently was uh, taking a lot of pills. We don't know exactly what kind of pills. Uh, but certainly someone uh, who was disaffected, very angry, uh, who had, from what we know, and you know how these things change by the hour and the day, who had very racist beliefs, but I believe all of that was part and parcel of probably some real uh, severe mental instability. When he, uh, he did two things, uh, allegedly, inside the church, uh, well, three. One, he, he sat there. Well, let me, let me focus on, on sitting there, because other mass shooters, it's not typical. Uh, I mean, I don't know how long J James Holmes sat in the movie theater. I don't think he did at all. He came in with all that armor and stuff. So to sit there and, 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 and pray with a small group or do church or Bible studies with a small group for an hour, how does that differentiate him uh, other than the fact that he did it? What, what, you know, what, what is going on in his psyche uh, compared to others who you know, go in, shoot, and get out? Well, this is a person perhaps who may have been wrestling with what he should do, uh, dealing with the demons in his head. And by the way, Steve, I'm not talking about whether this person may be psychotic or schizophrenic. We don't know anything about that. It may be pure hate that is also being driven by a severe personality disorder. So he either may have been mulling whether to do this or was letting the anger build to the point of where he could actually do something so atrocious. So you're, you're right on. This one is really different in that he was sitting there, but who knows, he might have been in some sort of a daze or disassociating uh, that he was able to sit there that long and then carry out this massacre. Now, what does it also say? He had a chance to kill everybody in that room, but if we're to believe the press reports, he left one woman alive and said to her, uh, I want you to tell the story of what you saw in here. Uh, what does that say to you? Well, it says to me that this is someone who's very, very sadistic and that it's, it's more than just about uh, killing uh, and from what we know, these uh, may have been all black people. It's more than just killing black people out of hate, perhaps out of racism, but making or giving a message to the world of his frustration, of his anger. And again, fitting that profile of, you know, it's not personal, folks. You just are symbols of what I hate. And I want to put that message out there. And I want to go down in history as being another one of these mass killers. What's different about this one is that he really did try to get away. He really did try to escape other than, 
you know, different than the ones who wait around or know that they're going to be surrounded and know that they're going to be shot. They go into it knowing they're committing suicide, not just homicide. I'm not quite sure what he was thinking on this one. Right. And because, uh, A, I mean, because he, he left uh, one victim alive to tell the story, but he also allegedly, you know, said uh, horrifically racial things like, you know, this is revenge because you rape our women, etc. cetera. Uh, so again, uh, is that all part of the story you say he wanted to get out uh, by leaving the one victim alive? Absolutely. I believe that is the story, a story of frustration. But, you know, this may be more than just, oh, I want the world to know, uh, you know, how uh, bad, uh, you know, black people are and how they're taking over our country. This could be his own personal frustrations that he wants the world to know about. And so it makes it not only a murderous and horrific, but a very selfish act because he believes that other people feel the same way he does. All right, that is interesting. All right, let, let, let's let's talk a little bit about in the remaining time we have Rachel uh, Dolezal. Um, uh, what do you make of this woman, who you know today, as an adult, after going through all this, after being exposed, and when all the facts are out, she still claims that even when she was five, she was identifying as black because she drew herself with a, a, a brown crayon, and then she goes so far as to say. Well, I can't prove that my parents who are white are really my parents. I mean, what, what do you call this besides nuts? Well, as a psychologist, uh, I, I just can't, and I know you're not doing it, but I just can't get on the bandwagon of people who've been ridiculing her and putting her down. I think for, for you and for me and for your... Well, I, I, to be honest with you, I've, I've done it to an extent because, you know, she, she claims she's black, yet she sued Howard University because they were discriminating against her because she said she was white. Steve, I've never examined this woman, but right from the very beginning when I was doing interviews, uh, I said very, very pointedly, uh, straight no chaser, that there are many complexities to this case, many psychodynamics. Uh, she said herself that she over-identified with being African-American, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have many white friends who do that, and, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine. But they're not lying as to what their race is. You ask them what their race, they tell you they're white. You ask them how are they thinking, they tell you they think black. That's all right. It's fine. But there are so many inconsistencies and such dishonesties that we're beginning to see with this that I think this really does speak of some emotional issue. She said herself, listen, the reason I uh, over-identified was I needed it as a form of survival. For me, that tells me that being black in her mind is not just an ideal, it's a coping mechanism. It's a way to keep her sanity, which means that there are some, and it's quite obvious, there's some severe emotional issues as part of her right. family well, constellation. Well, then, let, let me ask you, not to interrupt, let me, we have the Skype, so there's a little overlap. Let me ask you, um, do you see any, is this on the same plane psychologically in any way? Forget her lying. Um, which we all agree the dishonesty was reprehensible. But is there a trans race, like there's a transgender in your view? Um, we're starting to see more and more people have that conversation of transracial and, and, and race being more fluid. I think we'll see that. That's been a jumping off point with that. I think it's the wrong example to use because of the deception. So she's not a good test case, and I'm not putting her down in any way. But I think we do the transgender folks a uh, real disservice when we try to uh, hook up this uh, Rachel situation along with uh, her being, as she calls it, transracial, comparing that to transgender. That's, that's comparing apples to oranges. We've done many studies that show that transgender individuals um, have real reasons to want to change their sex. Uh, and in fact, they're looking at brain studies, genetic studies, and so on, and it is not unhealthy to be transgender. It is unhealthy, however, to be an individual who may lie about their race to their friends. No, no, yeah, absolutely. And I was trying to separate her lying, uh, and I guess we can't, uh, at least in your mind, from, you know, from uh, the actual believing or wanting to act black, as you said, you know, many white people do. But anyway, Doc, always great to talk to you, sir. And go to drjeffgardier.com, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, always uh, see the latest from the good doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Steve. All right, Larry Clayman is next. You're not going to want to miss this.